Chapter 9. Dane Loses Her Temper She had the oddest dream. She was Zek, and the world was huge. Kitten, who to Dane was the size of a medium-tall dog, looked like a three-horn to the marmoset. He watched the dragon sleepily from the bed as she walked to and fro on the floor, talking to herself. He could tell she was worried, but not about what. Then a section of the wall that was farthest from him swung open with a sound. Zek Dane leaped from the bed and hid underneath. Kitten whirled, turning orange with fright, as the Emperor Mage came in, a solid black crystal in his hand. He lobbed it gently at the dragon. It shattered on the floor without a sound, filling the air with smoke. When Zek could see Kitten once more, she was frozen in place, unmoving. Osor knelt in front of her and drew a hank of thin black cord from the pouch at his belt. Swiftly he unrolled it and bound Kitten's muzzle and paws, tying the two ends together when he was done. When he let go of the cord, it shone green, then vanished completely. Kitten's eyes closed, and she collapsed into the Emperor's arms. Osorn pointed to the door. Green fire left his finger, spreading to cover the opening. He then waved to someone in the hole in the wall. Slaves came, gathering up Dane's things. "'Be certain you take all of her belongings,' he instructed quietly. "'Not a single hairpin must remain.' Zek, wits made sharp by exposure to Dane, looked around. There was no place under the bed to hide if they looked there, and there was magic on the main door. He didn't know what lay beyond the opening in the wall, but in any event, the Emperor was between him and it. He peered at the corner near the windows. A cloth hanging was on the wall. Above it, near the ceiling, he saw a rectangular opening. An air vent. The Emperor's face appeared under the foot of the bed. There you are. Fire collected at his hand and lashed forward. The time to think was past. The marmoset raced from under the bed, scrambled up the hanging. Emerald fire lashed the cloth below. It burst into flame. Zek jumped into the vent and found himself in a long, dark tunnel not much bigger than he was. Turning, he saw that the tunnel ended nearby in an opening with a fine screen over it. No escape that way. "'Where are you, little rat?' he heard Osorn say. Zek fled down the long end of the tunnel into the palace depths. Dane continued to dream after that, funny images that had little in common with the dream she was used to. She wondered if she ought to complain to whoever was in charge of these things, but Ganiel, the master of dream, was not one of the easily found gods. With no one to protest to, she paid attention once more to the dreams. Guards formed a square around the Tortolans, marching them to a waiting ferry. Alana looked grim-faced behind the covey of clerks, eyes watching everywhere. Duke Gareth, Lord Martin, and Gareth Younger kept their heads together, whispering urgently. Harald gripped one of Numar's arms, talking fast as he half-trotted beside the much taller man. Dane wondered at the look on Numar's face. His nostrils and lips were white-rimmed, his eyes blazed. His unfastened robe spread behind him like black wings. The scene changed. She was in the Immortal's menagerie, watching as Osorn himself gently placed the sleeping kitten on a giant cushion inside a cage. Next to it, flesh-eating unicorns looked on with eyes that blazed hate. The next dream was an entire place set in a cramped shipboard cabin. It glowed in the corners of sparkling fire, shielded against eavesdroppers. Harel, Gareth the Younger, and the clerks were absent. Lord Martin and Duke Gareth were side by side on one of the bunks, watching Numer on the other. Lindell was also present, Bone Dancer the lizard bird on his shoulder. He looked deeply worried. In her dream, Dane was mildly surprised to see that Bone was still awake. She noticed, fascinated, that his empty eye sockets followed each speaker. Impossible, Lord Martin said curtly. Our duty is to return home and warn the king. She's one of ours, retorted Alana. The champion leaned against the wall, fisted hands thrust deep into her breeches pockets. That letter's a forgery. It must be. He's keeping her somewhere and using it as a pretext to end the talks and declare war. Duke Gareth looked at her, eyes sad. We cannot prove that, my child. Neither can we help Dane. We must warn the country. As it is, Tortle will stand alone against him. By announcing it before the foreign ambassadors, he made certain they believed his proof that Dane conspires against him. As far as our allies are concerned, we cause the talks to fail. You can warn Tortle, then, and the king, Nomer said quietly. I won't leave without her. We never should have brought that child, 
snapped Lord Martin. I knew it would be trouble. Standing, he approached the door. Let me pass, he ordered. A hole appeared in the magic. He opened the door and left. Once he was gone, the fire sealed the room tightly again. Aram, there's more at stake than any girl. Even this one. Lindell's absent-minded air was gone. The information passed to you, contacts, new routes for the safe underground, conspirators' names. It must go north, now, before the borders are closed by war. We may have to get the prince out in a hurry if the emperor begins to suspect him, and the only way to do it safely is to have all prepared on your end. Numer shook his head. I don't care. Someone else can take the information to the king. The champion whirled and slammed both fists into the wall. I hate not doing something, she cried. I hate it. I want to go back there and... The lizard bird leaped from his perch on Lindell, flapping clumsily across the room to land on Alana's shoulder. He ran his beak through her hair, trying to comfort her. Go away, you old bone, she whispered, but her heart wasn't in it. You cannot, my dear, Duke Garris said, his voice filled with pity. We are going to war. Your place is at home with the king and his armies. Alana's eyes brimmed with tears. She turned away from the men. Numer, if you choose to remain, I cannot stop you. You are too great a mage, the duke said. Please think, then. The emperor is mad, but not stupid. He knows you wouldn't leave Dane here. My concern is that he has planned for just that eventuality. Numer and Lindell exchanged looks. I'm aware of the danger, your grace, Numer said quietly. I have taken precautions. They may be enough. Osborne has trouble believing in his heart that anyone else has more of the gift than he does, even when his mind knows there are more powerful mages. I can use that to fool him. As for the knowledge of the prince's conspiracy, give it to me, Alana said curtly. It's the least I can do. She handed Bone Dancer to Lindell. Numer looked at the duke, who sighed and nodded. Getting up, the tall mage went over to Alana and placed his fingers on her temples. Black fire sparkled when they touched. Dane would have liked to view more, but the dream was pulling her away and her head ached. The dream headache turned into a real one as she awoke. Putting up a hand to shield her eyes from a light globe overhead, Dane found that she was stiff in places she hadn't known could get stiff. Arms and legs alike were slow to respond as she sat up and put her feet on the floor. Here was a strange thing. She sat on the floor. The bed on which she lay was only a thick pad, covered with a blanket. A stack of clean, fresh clothing lay next to the pad. As her eyes got used to the light, she realized that she was someplace totally unfamiliar. The room was a box. Its white plaster walls, floor, and ceiling were bare of any ornament. Three skins of liquid and a napkin bundle rested beside the pile of clothes. The skins contained water, the napkins stale rolls and grapes. A wooden bucket sat in the corner, she assumed for use as a privy. Fear chilled her. The door had no handle or knob. Running her fingers along the frame as high as she could reach, then down to the floor, she sought a lock or latch without success. She stripped off the clothes soiled in the aviary and put on the clean garments. It didn't escape her attention that they were her own things. She ate the rolls and fruit greedily and could have eaten more. How long had she been asleep? How long would it be until someone let her out? Did anyone mean ever to let her out? She searched the room, seeking locks, vents, or anything else. Only plaster met her fingers. A year earlier, Numer, telling her of his captivity before he'd escaped to Tortle, had said there were rooms under the palace that cancelled magic, used from within them or from without. If she was in such a room, Numer, Alana, and Herelt might seek her with their gift and never find her. And what about her dreams? Had they been true? Were her friends still in Karthik? By then she was trembling. She was caged. I want out, she whispered. The room was stuffy. She tried to fill her lungs without success. With no vents, she might run out of air. The walls drew closer. In a moment, she would stretch out her both arms and be able to touch them. No! she screamed, slamming into the door. No! No! The pain cleared the last traces of the drug from her mind, and she could hear her friends outside. Her prison might cancel the gift, but not wild magic. The people screamed with her throughout the palace and in the city, over the river. Dane roared her fury. Animals turned on the two-leggers. 
dogs set on master, cats the nearest passerby, birds drove nearby farmers out of their fields. Dane was in all of them, shrieking defiance of cage builders. In the palace, dogs and cats leaped for the mage Chioke. He threw up his hands. Orange fire lashed, crisping their bodies. Dane shrieked as their agony shot through her. Stop! she cried to the others. No, don't! Stop! They'll hurt you! They'll kill you! A hunter shot his horse with a crossbow. A soldier speared his camel. Osram flamed a charging pet monkey. The rest of the people calmed down and hid from sight. Dane collapsed to the mattress and wept. She had gotten her friends killed, and she was still trapped. She heard a thump somewhere near, and a click. Taking a deep breath, she shaped herself. Bones shifted. Skin and senses changed swiftly. Claws sprouted from paws the size of plates. Dane the bear plodded over to a corner behind the door. Rearing up on her hindquarters, she waited. The door opened. A cheetah entered the chamber, with Zek on his back. The marmoset clutched silvery metal in his paws. He looked at the bear and showed her his prize. Keys, Zek said proudly. Zek and his new friend Chirp, the Banjigu performer's male cheetah, led Dane through the web of branching tunnels under the palace, avoiding humans. At last they came to a round chamber deep underground, where odd-looking signs and runes had been painted on the walls. Tano, Chirp's trainer, waited there with fruit and water for Dane. It is safe to speak here and to be here, he told the girl as she ate. He pointed to the signs on the walls. This is protected place. Slave magic protects here from owner mages. Tell me what you need and we will find. She swallowed a mouthful of grapes. My friends, are they here? He shook his head. Two days ago, Emperor said you ran off to get slaves to rebel. His warriors take your friends to boat and guard it until they leave. The armies prepare for war. Their great drums pound all night. He shook his head. Sleep very bad. She thought over what all of that meant. The armies wouldn't march. Her animal friends would see to that. I need to talk to Prince Kadar. Will you trust him if you bring him down here? Or you could blindfold him if you aren't sure. But I trust him if that means anything. Tano nodded. You will leave this place? Go home? I have to do one or two things, but then I'm going. Now that she was awake, her dreams felt solid, more like visions than dreams. If that was so, the Numer was here somewhere. Tano, I have a message for you from the first badger, the male badger god. He said to tell the Banjigu that Lushigui never meant for you to be slaves. The black man frowned. Never? Dane shook her head. Tano thought this over, pulling thoughtfully on his lower lip. We must talk about this, the Banjigu. Talk comes later. I go for Prince now. You wait. As he trotted away, Chirp curled up next to Dane while the girl petted Zek. How did you find the keys? she asked. Where were they? How did you know they'd be the right ones? I found the Emperor when he went to feed his birds, Zek replied, nibbling a fig. Then he went to his room. In his wall there was a way down to the cage where he put you. He went down twice to look at you. Afterward, he put his keys near his bed. I took them and asked Chirp to bring me to you a different way than through his room. All the people knew how to find you once you woke up. Smugly, he added, but I am the only one of the people who knows about keys. You are the wisest, cleverest creature I've ever met, she whispered, cuddling him. You saved my life and my wits. Did you see where he took Kitten? I dreamed he enchanted her. Zek shook his head. He did not visit her, the marmoset explained. Dane leaned back against the wall. He wouldn't hurt her. I'm not at all sure he can. So he's put her somewhere, perhaps in the menagerie with the other immortals. I dream that's what he did anyway. We'll look and see. Still cuddling Zek, she dozed off until Chirp nudged her awake. Kadar and Tano were coming. When the prince saw her, he stopped, dark face turning ashen. Dane? Tano didn't say. She glared up at him. You know what your uncle did to me? We have to get her out of here, Kadar informed Tano. Once he finds her gone, he'll tear the palace apart. I'll go happily once I get Kitten back, she said. Tell me something, if you please. Do you know anything about a drug called Dream Rose? It produces sleep, he replied promptly, and true dreams. She nodded. 
All right, then. I think I'm fair certain Numer's still in Karthik. Once I find Kit, will you smoke me to the university? I can't leave this place without him. He... The look on the prince's face brought her up short. Something's wrong. Dane. She rose. What? Kadar put a clumsy hand on her shoulder. Please, try to remain calm. Your uncle tricked me, drugged me, put me in a locked room with no air and stale food, and then he made my friends leave without me. He also kidnapped my dragon, and I want her. And he's using this as an excuse to start a war with Tortle. I won't be calm for weeks, so you'd best tell me. They caught him, Master Numer. He gave them the slip in Thak's gate, but they found his hiding place at the university. And my uncle wouldn't risk his escape. Not a second time. He was executed a day ago. For a moment she listened, but heard only an ominous thudding in her ears. Then she said flatly, You're lying. He squeezed her shoulder, not about something like this. Then Ozorn lied to you. I saw it. He made me watch along with everyone else at the university. Dane, I'm sorry. Numer Solomon is dead, and we have to get you out of Karthik. Coolness trickled into her mind until her skull was filled with it. Her world seemed extra sharp and extra real. Part of her, someplace deep inside, wailed. That seemed unreal, as if she watched a crying baby from a great distance. Kadar was shaking her. Dane? Can you hear me? She gently pushed his hands away. Stop that. I'm thinking. His eyes and Tano's held the same worried, frightened look. You weren't listening. You looked frozen. She put a finger to her lips and he shut up. A thought was coming in the distance. She waited patiently, skin rippling in brief shivers, until it reached her. Osorn had to pay. The gods had taken too long to say whatever it was they'd planned to say here. With all those omens importance they had sent, the sole effect had been her kidnapping and her friend's execution. Plainly, she would have to take care of this herself. If any gods tried to stop her, they would regret it. What time of the day is it? Her voice sounded distant, but reasonable. Something about her, though, must not be right. She saw that Chirp backed away to press against Tano's legs, fur on end. Both men began to sweat. Mid-afternoon, replied the Benjigu, eyes bright with concern. Where is Emperor Ozorn, your highness? Across the river, reviewing the army of the north. They march in two days to the staging point in Thak's gate. She had no interest in armies at this point. Will he return today? Y yes, he has to meet with some officials. When? Kadar wiped his forehead on his arm. After sunset? Tano, could you pass word to all the slaves by dusk if you had to? The black man nodded. Dane looked at Kadar. Does anyone that you care about live in the palace? He wet his lips with his tongue. Yes, but tell the slaves and your friends to be ready by nightfall. When things break loose, they must leave the palace. I don't care where they go, so long as they do. She sat down again and let Zek climb into her lap. You can't just... Something in her face made him stop back. Please don't say what I must and mustn't do, Highness. It was amazing how cold she felt. Hurry now. Dark comes early here, I've found. Tenno, the Emperor's birds. The little man bowed deeply, hands crossed over his breast. One of the tunnels opens inside the glass birdhouse, great one. If I tell them to go with you and your folk and not be frightened, will you carry them to a safe place? They won't try to escape you. Tano nodded. We will take them away gladly. Dane nodded. Thank you. Before dark, please. Tano bowed again and drew the prince away. Chirp followed them into the tunnels. Dry-eyed, the girl stared at the ceiling. You don't have to stay, Zek. It may be scary. I will stay, replied the marmoset. Scary with you is better than scary without you. Dane tickled the stomach gently, then closed her eyes. I didn't get to say goodbye or anything. She swallowed hard. Her friend, her teacher, 
He had shown her the use of her wild magic, looked after her when her first trial with it backfired, taught her the science that enabled her to learn more about the people than she had ever dreamed of knowing. Gathering up her power, she spoke first to Osorn's birds. It was quick work to persuade them to go with the black men and women who had already begun to emerge from an opening in the aviary floor. Once all of them had gone back into the tunnels with the Banjiku, she cast her wild magic to the far side of the river Sakoi and summoned every small creature that crawled, walked, or flew to the camp of the Army of the North. Let Osorn see how far his soldiers could march with gnawed rope and leather, bad food, foul water, and useless weapons. Anyone who tried to use ballista or catapult would be in for an unpleasant surprise, as would the wagon drivers. Mule skinners and horse masters wouldn't go very far without their charges. She had done it before, calling on her friends to harass the enemy in a siege or to keep soldiers too busy to go to anyone's aid. Never before had she done it on this scale, but it wasn't that hard to summon thousands instead of hundreds or tens. It was almost a relief. If Osorn's gods weren't prepared to instruct him on polite behavior, she would have to do so. The mingled voices of her friends above the ground told her at last the dark had come. Guided by a helpful cat, using cat's eyes to see in the dark, she found her way through the underground tunnels until they had reached a trapdoor that opened into the Hall of Bones. Thank you, she told the cat as she tucked Zek into her shirt, and now you'd best get out. It's going to be very busy here for a while. The cat rubbed affectionately against her shins and raced off into the darkness. Ready? Dane asked Zek. She could see his wide eyes and feel him tremble slightly. No, he told her. Go ahead anyway. She climbed the ladder to raise the trapdoor half an inch. The room above was dark and empty. Climbing out, she looked around. She was in a niche between the mountain runner nest and the hall where the smaller skeletons were kept. These wouldn't do. Turning, she entered the hall of the larger dinosaurs and went to the three-horn that faced the main door. It seemed right to begin with him. Rubbing her hands, she touched the skeleton's long nose horn. White fire blazed. The dinosaur tossed its head as if to shake off sleep. Now that's the wrong way to go about it, said a cracked voice. You'll kill yourself again, and you won't rouse nearly enough of them. Dane faced the graveyard hag. You, she hissed coldly. Am I angry enough now? Isn't this what you wanted? No, was the frank reply. I wanted you to wake the human dead. Give them a start to see corpses dancing in their streets. It'd be just like the old days. Well, for your time, of course. Dane rested a hand on the three horns neck frill. It had moved up beside her and stood firmly braced, as if telling the goddess that she would have to go through it to get to Dane. And when the dead lie back down, the mortals will forget. A couple weeks, a month, and it'll seem like a bad dream. I want to give them a lesson that will keep them busy a while. What might that be, dearie? Palaces are important, replied the girl. Rulers keep their gold and gems and art in palaces. The tax rolls and imperial records are here somewhere. If I rip this palace apart, it'll take them years to clean up. They'll have something besides going to war with their neighbors to do. And if I kill him... A new emperor might not be so bad. Guaranteed, they'd go back to proper worship of the gods. I imagine that would make all of you happy. The goddess frowned. It's not what I would do. What you would have done, you should have done years ago, Dane cried, voice breaking. If you hadn't let it go and let it go, things not might have come to this state. But you didn't, and you left it to me, so now we'll do it like I want to. Add your own flourishes if you wish, but either help me or get out of my way. The hag sighed. You don't understand. I don't want to understand. We can't just do whatever we feel like, the goddess said. There are rules even for us. We can only work on something like this through a mortal vessel, for one thing. Do you know how few mortals can be used as a god's vessel without dying on us? And I was reluctant to act, I confess. That nice boy Osorn wooed me like a maiden. Flowers on my altar every day, precious oils, public feasts in my honor. Oh, it was grand. So maybe I wasn't strict with him, and now he's too big for his breeches. It hurt when he stopped leaving flowers, you know. I was the last god still defending him in Mythros's court. 
She sighed and shook her head. These men say they care for me, and I fall for it every time. Too good-hearted, that's me. My heart bleeds buttermilk, Dane snapped. The graveyard hag shook her stick at the girl. If I didn't need you, but you do. You said it yourself, vessels are hard to come by. So can we get on with it, please? I need strength enough to wake up all these big ones. Strength. The hag rubbed her chin. There's always the rats. You'll have to offer them something, though. Even I can't make them help for nothing. There's rules, yes, you told me. The hag tapped her on the head with her stick. Don't be impudent, Weirin's daughter, and think up something nice to offer my rats. The tap made her ears ring and her eyes burn. She rubbed both. When she looked around again, the graveyard hag was gone. Zek poked his head out of her shirt. Are you all right? he asked. Your bones are humming. I'm not surprised, she murmured, patting the three-horned's neck frill when he nudged her. Zek, what can I offer rats? Food, he replied immediately. Rats are always hungry. I could do with a bite myself. She dug in her pocket for raisins left from the meal Tano had given her in the tunnels. As the marmoset nibbled them, she thought hard and fast. On the edges of her awareness, she could feel rats approaching, hundreds of them. Where could she get enough food to bribe them all? She was in a palace. Most of the provisions for Varys' fancy dinners were already here. Of course, the food stores were guarded by an army of rat catchers. Smiling grimly, she called to the hundreds of cats and dogs who worked the palace and grounds. As she conferred with them, rats streamed into the hollow bones through every hole, vent, and crack. Once the dogs and cats agreed to her request, she looked around. The great dinosaur skeletons now bore passengers. Rats, black ones and brown, large and small, well-fed glossy ones, and scrawny river rats decorated with scars. A brown female with one missing eye stood at Dane's feet. Herself told us you want to make a deal, she said. Something to trade for our wild magic so you can wake these old bone piles. The three horn apparently heard this. It looked down and nudged the rat with its nose horn. The rat bared yellow incisors. You don't scare me, dead beast, she snarled. There's enough of us here to do for you. Dane patted the skeleton's neck frill. It's all right. They're on our side, I think. We don't side with anybody that ain't a rat, the female snapped. From the darkness all around them came chittering agreement from the others. Pipe down, ordered the rat chieftain. So what's the deal then, two-legger? I plan to leave this palace a wreck. Plenty of supplies buried under stone and in rooms the men can't reach, replied Dane. So, if you give me what I need, the dogs and cats agreed not to hunt anywhere in the palace or on the grounds for a year and a day. I can't get rid of the human mages, but the dogs and cats will go, if you help me. That's the deal. The rats conferred, the whispers loud in the echoing hall. Finally, the one-eyed female, who looked like the graveyard hag herself, squealed, We have a bargain. The rats moved into the second hall, where the smaller dinosaurs were kept. Once they were settled, Dane got to work, drawing on the power they gave her as, one by one, she woke the great skeletons. Down the row of horn-faced reptiles she went, rousing each of their kindred, the bull, spiked, close-horned, one-horned, thick-nosed, and well-horned dinosaurs. None were shorter than a man's height at the shoulder, and some were half again as tall. Each came to life at a white-fired touch and stretched lazily. They seemed to know she had business with them, for while they flexed limbs, tails, and bodies, they stayed in place, waiting. Next she went to the armored lizards, with their back and head spikes and their bone-tail clubs. Mixed in among them were their cousins, armored lizards, who had traded the tail club for heavy side spikes. Most of the armored lizards were as tall as the horn faces. They too woke readily at her call, working kinks out of muscle and cartilage that were no longer there. After them she went to the plated lizards, remembering their mace-like tails. Next she woke the snake necks. While they weren't armored as the others were, their bulk and long tails would make fast work of obstacles. At last she reached the tyrant lizard and his kin the meat eaters. Originally she thought they would be little help since their arms were so weak looking, but she had reconsidered. Something about those great skulls with their forward pointed eyes and saw edged teeth told her they would make excellent hunters. Their cousins the wounding lizards had stronger arms with large claws. 
Once they and the eight mammoths were awake, she went to the front of the hall. Now she heard booming sounds at the doors. Evidently someone had raised an alarm, and humans were trying to come in. Even if they had a mage to speak the opening spell, it would still take them a while to enter. The bull three-horn leaned against the inward opening doors, holding them shut. Friends, the girl said, voice echoing. The master of this palace killed my friend, stole a dragon, and tried to cage me. He is a thief and a murderer. He needs a lesson. You can't be hurt as my mortal friends can. You are ancient and powerful. Will you help me get revenge? I would like to rip this palace apart, stone by stone. I want to topple the columns, break the walls, crush the fountains. Will you do it? From tyrant lizards to horn faced, the skulls of her allies pointed to the ceiling as one. She couldn't hear their roar of agreement, but she felt it in the quiver of the ground under her feet. A four-toothed elephant wrapped his trunk around her waist and placed her gently on the back of a shaggy mammoth out of harm's way. Thank you, she told him. To the others, she said, I'd rather not kill any two-leggers, but I know if you're attacked, you'll fight back. Just please look where you step, and don't hurt anyone who's smart enough to run. The bull three-horn backed away from the doors. Both leaves slammed open to reveal a very young mage and a squad of men from the Red Legion. The Hall of Bones was still unlit. The mage clapped to waken the light globes. When they blazed into life, they revealed nearly seventy long-dead creatures who had left their pedestals and were walking toward the intruders. The mage screamed and ran. The guardsmen followed, dropping their spears. Outside the Hall of Bones, Dane's army split into three groups. One, led by the great three-horn she had awakened first, turned in the direction of the wing in which the palace records were kept. The second group, led by the chief tyrant lizard, began in the great hall where they now stood, smashing pottery, windows, and benches, ramming the walls, and toppling fountains. A plated lizard discovered the anchor chain of an immense light globe chandelier and began to tug it from its mooring. The third group, which included Dane, her mammoth, the bull three-horn who had blocked the door into the Hall of Bones, and others, was ready to go. Zek, she asked the marmoset, could you find the way back to the Emperor's chambers? He clambered down the front of her shirt and along the mammoth's back until he perched in solitary grandeur on the creature's head. That way, he said, pointing left. Dane tapped the mammoth with her left foot and he obediently moved forward. The tiny animal on his skull lurched and almost fell, then grabbed tufts of the mammoth's fur to use as reins. Two snake necks, each over eighty feet long, wound their tails through the door handles to the hollow bones and began to walk away. They didn't stop, even when their tails were stretched as far as possible. In the end, it was the doors that gave way, snapping out of the frame and leaving it in splinters. The snake necks then followed Dane, freeing their tails from the wreckage. Behind them, a ringing crash signaled the end of the plated lizard's attention to the chandelier. Zack's next turn brought them into a long gallery lined with niches. In each stood a gold statue of the Carthage Emperor, decorated with gems and designed to show the monarch with those things that symbolized his reign. The dinosaurs got to work, pulling statues down and trampling them flat. One plated lizard made the windows his sole task, smashing each and every one with his spiky tail. A four-toothed elephant ripped doors off hinges with his trunk. People spilled from the rooms that opened into the statuary hall, stared at the dinosaurs, and fled. Near the end of the gallery, a side door leading to the noble's wing crashed open. Five people rushed in. Two of the women were veiled. A female slave carried a baby. When the women saw Dane's friends, they began to scream. The old man and the boy put themselves between their womenfolk and the threat, though their hands trembled as they gripped their weapons. Stop that noise, Dane ordered. No one's hurting you. The only one to listen was a slave, who tried to calm the shrieking infant. Get out of here, the girl went on. My friends won't hurt you if you don't attack them and don't get under their feet. Now move. The humans ran. Dane looked at Zek. Do we go the way they did? Zek shook his head. Straight, he said, pointing to the doors at the end of the hall. In the distance, they heard the crash of falling stone. Behind them, the thick-nosed, horn-faced dinosaur leaned on the marble wall. When an armored lizard joined him, the blocks of stone began to give way. Zek led them through a tree garden, which they left as it was. 
The next turn brought them into one of the palace's many bathhouses, this one set aside for nobles. It seemed that those inside had not heard the distant sounds of mayhem. They were taken completely by surprise and fled without recovering their clothes. Tyrant lizards ripped up sections of the tile floor, laying bare a forest of gleaming pipes. A mammoth and a four-toothed elephant seized these, yanking them from their moorings and showering everything with hot and cold water. Armored lizards walked through rooms where clothing, robes, and towels were kept, catching them on their side spikes and dragging them along. Mud baths were overset, rubbing tables torn apart, steam rooms dismantled. Their next turn led them through storerooms. Snake necks destroyed countless jars of raisins, olives, dates, fresh fruits, and vegetables, wielding their tails like whips. Tyrant lizards tore their sharp teeth through pounds of dried and salted meat. Dane noticed coolly that the food vanished once it had entered their mouths. The others preferred the grain stored in great burlap sacks. The last storeroom held drinkables in bottles, jars, and barrels. They had gone to work when the other mammoth in their group lifted a screaming female from a hiding place behind the casts. Pale blue fires danced around her body as she fought the trunk around her waist without success. The mammoth brought her to Dane and set her gently on the floor. Dane stared down at Varys Kingsford, fingers nodding in her mammoth's long fur. "'Tell me why I shouldn't have you ripped to pieces,' she demanded. "'Were you at his killing? Were you serving pretty food and fancy wine?' Varys got herself under control and shook her head. "'Did you betray him to the Emperor?' "'I don't expect you to believe me, but no. Maybe I would have if he'd come to me.' You don't know what it's like to be in the service of a man like Osorn, but I didn't betray Aram. Zek looked at Dane from his seat on the mammoth's head. Why are you angry? he asked. She has been sad. She isn't wearing the smelly stuff she likes, or the pretty colors on her face and hands. He was right. The woman was pale, her eyes red with long weeping. She wore no makeup at all. Her blonde hair, uncurled and unarranged, hung lank and straight down her back. Even her dress was plain, a loose-fitting gown of dove-gray cotton. Her mage's robe was nowhere to be seen. Varys met Dane's eyes. You must think I'm useless and silly. Maybe I am. I just like things pretty. Is that so bad, to want people to enjoy themselves? Only, when you have the gift, you can't just go to parties and keep house. They expect you to study, and to do something in life. Aram... He always wanted me to learn more spells and be famous. I don't want to be famous. What I do is useful. And I like using my gift for cooking and baking. Great power hasn't brought the mages I know happiness or peace of mind. Dane stared down at the blonde. Vera sounded like Ma, whose greatest pleasure had lain in dancing and working in the garden or kitchen. Quietly, she said, you needn't explain yourself to me. Vera blotted her eyes on her sleeve. I begged, she said, voice hoarse. Sometimes it works. I said, what's the point of killing Aram? Other monarchs would fear Karthak more if he showed mercy to his betrayer. But it didn't help. He made me watch when they killed. I'll never forget that as long as I live. Ferris, Dane said. The cold inside her prevented tears, but she felt bad for the older woman. We have no quarrel with you. The gods are unhappy with Osorn, and I'm helping them, but you don't have to be involved. Get out of here. Shelter at the university if you can get across the river, or the estates outside the palace grounds. You won't be safe here. Varys nodded and gathered up her skirts. Dane's army parted to let her pass, then set about destroying the room. The horn-faced lizards testing the walls found they were wood, not stone. They began to smash them, wall after wall, working back through the storage rooms. When Dane moved on, some armored lizards and a mammoth stayed, as did the bull three-horn, to handle the stone walls. The echo of crashing stone followed Dane out.